When somebody starts to overheat and when the body starts to uh, lose its ability to thermoregulate, uh, what happens is you start to see a cognitive de decline, and that could be memory impairment, judgment, a whole host of other things. You can also see some physical attributes that tend to take a hit, and that could be from dexterity loss. You can see muscle cramps. There's a whole host of um uh, physical manifestations of some, somebody becoming overheated, for example. So the good news is this is 100% preventable if you're utilizing the proper techniques. Hello, and welcome back to the Labor, Health, and Safety Fund of North America's vodcast series. My name is Ryan Pepperello, and I'm the Safety and Health Specialist for the fund. Today, we are discussing wearable technology and construction and how the new approach to protecting workers is gaining more and more popularity. Wearable technology is all around us. Uh, you can't go too far uh, without seeing someone wearing these devices. Studies show that number of uh, the number of wearable devices worldwide has doubled uh, in a span of three years. But in the U.S. alone, more than a fifth of the population are using these devices, as many take a greater interest in tracking and monitoring their health, such as heart rate, steps taken, blood oxygen levels, and something that I use a lot, sleep. Wearable technology or wearables, consisting of many different types of styles and mainly have one goal to collect data. This data has been proven to protect workers on job sites from many different exposures. Wearables in construction can include watches, rings, phones, and smart uh, personal protective equipment, all the way up to exoskeletons and virtual reality headsets. On today's episode, I'm joined by two guests that are both well-versed on wearable technology. Uh, both of you, you know, Kyle, whoever wants to go first, uh, give a little brief uh, introduction for us, whoever wants to go first. <laughs> you go ahead, go ahead, Dr. Carter. Oh, thank you very much. And thank you very much, Ryan, um, for the invitation to be part of this episode. Um, my name is Emanuele Cauda. I am a researcher at NIOSH the National Institute for Occupational Health and Safety, um, which is part of CDC, um, and we are part of uh, the HHS Department of the Federal Government. Uh, within NIOSH, I am the director for the Center for Direct Reading and Sensor Technologies. The center is a virtual uh, place in NIOSH that coordinate all the activities and research around sensors. And um, we also engage with interaction with outside parties, whether are researchers or practitioners or anybody that is in, interested in the idea of using sensors in the workplace for health and safety. Thank you, Dr. Cowder. Kyle? Uh, thank you very much for inviting us as well. Uh, so I'm here to represent uh, Kenzen. Uh, we're a workforce safety technology company, uh, definitely specialize in the uh, smart PPE uh, area of focus that you're talking about. Uh, I'm the CEO of, of Kenzen, so I will help understand and paint a picture about just why we're here and what we're trying to do and how we're utilizing uh, sensor technology, algorithms, and helping prevent workplace injury. All right, great. Thank you so much for, for joining us. I want to jump into the heat because that's really something that's been on our radar for a few months, especially with the National Emphasis Program put out by OSHA. Uh, with the state health, uh, you know, heat um, uh, prevention plans that have, have been put out with Oregon, Washington State, Minnesota, California. So, um, you know, go ahead, Kyle, if you want to uh, jump into your pitch and, and and see where we can start this conversation on heat, which is a, a big topic. Yeah, yeah. So we'll we'll do that. You know, I think you brought up a few uh, good points here, just around uh, some of the momentum we're seeing from. A legislative area, so where it comes to standards that are trying to be implemented, there's also a pretty great uh, demand, not only from workers who who want to keep themselves safe and and want to go home safe at the end of the night, um, but also from employers. Uh, there's a huge trend, and and I do think it's a secular trend here, uh, where where you're seeing employers starting to invest in. Uh, their workforce more heavily and utilizing technology that they otherwise hadn't before. Uh, and that's really where where we come in. And so 
our prime focus or mission is to be able to prevent uh, injury and death on site. That is number one. Uh, that shouldn't happen. And I think everybody's on the same page and wanting to utilize whatever's available to them to prevent those. Uh, along the way, there's a pretty strong argument and a lot of data to support uh, improving safety metrics. Uh, so when you do in implement technology that works and you use it well, you'll see those improve. Productivity will improve. Uh, and there's a whole host of other um, metrics that you'll see, some which are more abstract around uh, mood uh, and the way workers interact with each other just by keeping them safe and keeping them at a more uh, moderate uh, working condition. So it certainly Kenzin uh, is in, in the field all over uh, the world. So uh, we've been deployed to six out of the seven continents, uh, which is exciting uh, yet to be in Antarctica. That'd be more hypothermic instead of hyperthermic. Uh, but we always like to say, especially around overheating and, and, and when it pertains to physiology or human physiology, it's not an industry problem and it's not a worksite problem. It is a human problem. So anytime you're looking at and trying to help humans, yes, it is unique from human to human, but it's also something that is applicable to every job site. And so just to kind of identify identify heat, what it's important to understand is when somebody starts to overheat and when the body starts to uh, lose its ability to thermoregulate, uh, what happens is you start to see a cognitive de decline and that could be memory impairment, judgment, a whole host of other things. You can also see some physical attributes that tend to take a hit and that could be from dexterity loss. You can see muscle cramps. There's a whole host of um, uh, physical manifestations of some, somebody becoming overheated, for example. So the good news is this is 100% preventable if you're utilizing the proper techniques. And so there are um, a few best practices around a um, one size fits all, and that could be work rest regimes. Uh, it could be, um, you know, utilizing some sort of uh, rehydration metrics that is kind of a, a one size fits all, but unfortunately it's not applicable to, to everyone. So you're not going to be able to help everyone in that way. So you wanna be specific, you wanna be unique and you wanna make sure it's designed for the individual. And so when we're talking about keeping individuals uh, to a moderate working uh, level that I mentioned before, uh, when you're specifically talking about thermal stress or thermal strain, which we can kind of get into here in a minute, you want to ensure that the body's core temperature or that which the organs operate, uh, it, it re remains in a somewhat uh, um, moderate level, uh, a, a safe operating level, I guess you could say. And if you do that, you can prevent uh, your extreme version of uh, thermal stress. So like a heat stroke would be the extreme version. Uh, and, and that can have pretty detrimental effects uh, in the short term and also long term. Those who end up with a thermal stress incident or heat illness like that um, may suffer uh, from it for their entire lives. It may be more difficult for them to thermoregulate. So it's quite important uh, for individuals not to reach that point. The way to do that is to stop them, uh, stop their core temperature from getting to that point. And so the body does a pretty good job of being able to thermoregulate in different conditions, and it utilizes things like conduction and um, breath and evaporation through sweat. And so there's different mechanisms, uh, but it still goes back to ensuring that core temperature, the temperature of your organs doesn't exceed certain uh, thresholds. Uh, so um, NIOSH has also put out some guidance on what those thresholds are. Uh, so our alerts are specifically set up to adhere to those. Uh, and what our technology does is it predicts core temperature uh, within ground truth accuracy and gives the worker an alert when their core temperature is getting too high. And that lets them know they can stop. It's time to take a break, rehydrate. Uh, and then when their physiology returns, they'll get a, a different haptic alert and they can return to work. Uh, and that will keep them in a, a very safe um uh, safe range. And so it's also important to know when a worker has compounding stress, so it could be working in the heat day after day or longer days, their risk of reaching these levels uh, tends to grow uh, over time. So it's it's important to ensure your body does have a, a proper amount of um, uh, rest. So moving on to the technology itself, uh, the 
algorithms that are built for an individual, they are very specific and individual to that person. Uh, so each person gets a different algorithm on the device. The device is worn on their upper arm and the device specifically, as I mentioned, will compute, it will predict, and it will alert the individual when their core temperature gets too high and also when it returns. Uh, we're also based in uh, Microsoft Azure. So um, we're a cloud-based uh, company. And that means that uh, the, the physiology data is in the cloud and it can be viewed specifically by supervisors, for, for example. Now, I, we'll talk about this, I think, a little bit, but it's important to know that um, the data is used just as an indicator for health and safety. It's not used you know, to, to be sold. It's not used to make employment decisions. It's used as health and safety. Uh, so what you really want to do is ensure that supervisors are using it to stop or help a worker if they're in, in need uh, or help them and guide them to a safe working condition uh, to return back to work. Uh, it's also important to uh, ensure that technology is safe and secure. So ensuring data is encrypted. You also want to ensure that uh, their you know, technology companies are uh, implementing the best uh, security protocols. So you'd want to look for SOC 2. So we're SOC 2 compliant. Um, ISO 27001 is, is another compliance. Um, around privacy, you want to look for GDPR uh, and CCPA, which is California's data protection. And I can stop there. I, I just wanted to give a brief introduction of what we're doing, how we're uh, positioning our product on work sites, and and why it's important. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Kyle. I, uh, you know, it's it's very interesting where we've come with heat. Uh, it seems like this year has just been a, a leading. Uh, you know, we have leading and, and lagging indicators, but this is one thing that we're just, you know, we're really trying to get the steps in place to to really get ahead of of the heat because we are seeing rising temperatures even from Pittsburgh to California you know east coast to west coast we're seeing a lot of rising temperatures so um with heat you know what why is Kenzen so focused on just heat I don't know if you get this question a lot but <laughs> Yeah, I, I would say because, it, first of all, it, it, it's preventable. Uh, so in, in those situations, if you can prevent something, you should, and the technology is there to do it. Um, I would say heat is incredibly difficult to manage. Uh, it is also uh, a condition that um, is hard to get ahead of unless you have technology to do so. And so many times when an individual starts to feel overheated, many times it's too late. Uh, and, and so that, you know, we, we want to ensure that, uh, individuals have the insight and the ability to uh, stop and prevent that. So um, heat specifically is where we see a huge, um, a huge need uh, to be able to help workers uh, and, and people in general. Climates are getting, uh, you know, hotter, more unpredictable, more extreme. Uh, the conditions in which individuals are working are also lending themselves to a more intense uh, workplace. And so this is one of the few uh, physiological um, uh, components that feeds into whether somebody is, is safe at work. Uh, so we really want to address that. And we do think that being able to address uh, overheating, you'll be able to minimize even some of the workplace safety incidents as they tend to get higher when temperatures get higher. Uh, so we think it's, it's it's pretty good. And and the, the last thing I'll say is, you know, we're, we're talking about a short-term um, uh, situation here, but we also understand there are long-term effects of overheating. So if we can improve workplace safety and improve the lives of workers into their retirement ages, that's that's important. And I think everyone on, on the Kenzen team is really um, focused and passionate about, um, you know, it, it improving the human condition overall. And honestly, like I said, it's a great topic because it is it is the the top tier topic, it seems like, in at least in D.C. It's something that we're talking about a lot. And OSHA, it, it's been on their radar since uh, last September when their national emphasis program came out. Uh, this is a question that goes to both of you, really. Who can who can or should use wearable technology in heat or beyond? I mean, who who should be using this technology? Whoever wants to jump in on that one. Well, maybe um, I can start first. Um, if you don't mind, Ryan, I think it would be important at least to give a, probably a perspective about what we talk about when we talk about wearable technologies, because personal monitoring is honestly nothing too new for occupational health and safety. Um, we had uh, the use of personal monitors for gas and vapor, for particulate, for noise, for sound level meters. 
Um, one thing that at NIOSH we are trying really to, to work a lot is to educate people um, about the definition. So wearable technologies, basically, they should embrace the concept of wear and forget. So the minimum, the burden for the worker should be very minimal. Um, and in the case, for example, of Keynes and what Kyle showed, uh, that's the idea of something that is at the arm of the worker. It can be a safety vest with sensor uh, capabilities. Um, so it's important to define in that way. Um, there are basically two main benefits that we can see from a wearable perspective, and Kyle touched base on that already. One is the idea of the very true personalized, timely information back to the worker. So like, and so when you think about who should wear it, they should be part of a discussion from an health and safety management system probably is, who should be more, um, who will be the most important worker to wear it so that the timely information is provided to that person. And that's part of a decision-making about assessment of the situation of the workplace. The second back the second idea is wearables should also be so affordable that they could be a widespread use. And so from a perspective of who should wear it, one of the ideas of wearables is more people than traditional personal monitors. When you imagine a gas and vapor real-time monitor, few people are wearing it or using it for a few hours. Wearables should be used basically by a wider range of workers in a workplace in for a longer period of time, rather than one shift only every month, it should be like 24 hours or at least during the worship every single day. Um, they will be, build a lot of data, almost with the concept of big data, which can help a lot. I guess Kyle can build on that from a perspective of algorithm and understanding completely what is the situation. Um, I don't wanna go too much in technicalities, but especially for example, for thermal stress, the idea of the similar exposure group or SEG might not apply because you really don't know what is the response of everyone from a perspective of physiological response. So the idea of having more workers wearing wearables might be um, a, one of the benefits of adopting these type of technologies. And I think I'm going to stop here, at least as an intro, and let Kyle um, give his perspective. Yeah, I, I mean, I would, I would piggyback on on what he said. I, I think anytime you can implement, uh, especially wearable technology that will help augment uh, an individual's understanding of their own physiology, is quite important uh, in in different factors. And and I know there are different uh, workplace hazards. So um, as Dr. Cato was saying, there's also you know. Um, gas detection, et cetera, which has been in, in the workforce, uh, those are important. So anything that you can use that will sort of augment that is, is extremely helpful. Um, but, it, you know, as long as it's done in a, in a thoughtful way, it gives the user the ability to interact with the technology. Uh, and, and really what I think needs to be done is something that's very simple and actionable. Uh, so it needs to be something that the the workers know what to do with, um, and I think as technology sort of emerges and it and it continues to to get better and, and a little bit simpler and uh, functions a little bit better and more precise, it'll be easier to do so. But the, I think what you want to prevent is uh, trying to um, implement things which may not be applicable to that specific uh, work site. So if you're looking at overheating, um, you need to be careful about uh, who you're looking at. It may not be office workers, for example, in occupational settings, and maybe individuals who are uh, in, in specific areas, which there are hazards, but it's also understanding what those hazards are. So generally, um, you know, it, you may look at, you know, new workers, for example, who are on the job for the first six months or a year and may be um, predisposed to um, a higher incidents of uh, safety in incidents. So it, it, I would say it needs to be on, on the employer. So they should have the autonomy to make these decisions. Uh, but I think you really can't go wrong by implementing new technology that is helpful to, uh, to the worker and, and to the company. Good. No, that's a, that's true, and especially, and it's something that we we do talk about. And I'm going to go back to that because um, with the new infrastructure bill, we're going to be seeing a lot of new workers. We're going to see a lot of people that are coming into the industry that haven't been working in construction or they're new to the field because we we've seen that we're finding harder. It's, it's harder and harder to find workers, but um, now we're we're going to be getting them 
into this. And with, you know, with the wearable technology, with the climatization, all these, all these different moving pieces that come together, we can protect them in, in that case. Talking about workers, um, and, and this is something that we we found with um, you know detaching the you know any any really devices that you're putting on workers, with introducing wearable technology, are you seeing both of you? Are you seeing any pushback uh, with workers? I know some topics are privacy, some topics are, are you know um, is this comfortable or not? You're 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 just putting a bunch of things on me <laughs> as the worker besides PPE. Um, is there any pushback that you're really seeing out there? Yeah, so so I'll start. Yeah, absolutely. I think anytime you see a change in process, um, you know, humans, uh, as progressive as we can be, uh, we can also be resistant to change. So anytime you're implementing new technology, new processes, you need to explain and explain why. And so there needs to be an inherent benefit uh, for a user to want to adopt it. I, I would say that that's number one. So that, you know, in this case with overheating, they need to understand it's an issue. Either I've overheated before, I've seen somebody overheat, I understand the effects of it, and this technology I can see will help. Uh, and I, I would say that's number one. Um, the, the second thing that that you see, and I think this is, um, you know, it, it's important from uh, from a position from from all of us actually, and that's around uh, data security and privacy. So, you know, our we know in in today's age, um, our, our data can be used or misused in a lot of different ways. So, you want to ensure, especially if it's physiological data. Uh, that that it's being well taken care of, and the companies know what they're doing with the technology. Um, on the other side, you also want to ensure your employer is doing what's correct with the technology and not misusing it or abusing it. So I think those are two important things to know. Um, the, the third part of this that I always like to clarify a little bit is just so they understand what's being collected and how it can or cannot be used. And so there's a difference, for example, from um, biometrics, which can tie a, uh, something back to an individual like a retinal scan or a fingerprint scan, as opposed to physiological data. So if you're looking at um, a heart rate or core temperature, that's not something unique to an individual. You couldn't tie that back to them. So you just need to understand what's being collected and you know if something did happen could it be used against them i think that's what users want to know and, and if you can explain that and assure them that's another barrier to kind of uh to kind of take down yeah maybe i can um expand a little bit more i i agree what kyle said i think there are already a number of studies in the construction sector on the possibility of using wearable sensors in construction um, that have been published. And they all show basically that the main concern or the, the highest pushback by workers is when wearables are not used for health and safety, but are using to track workers or to track the productivity. So actually the acceptability, we can talk about acceptability by workers, which is really critical in the case of wearables because where workers are becoming basically the gatekeeper of the devices and even of the quality of the data collected by the devices. So unless the workers are on board, so they accepted the device, the, the entire process is basically workless. Um, but if the workers understand and if, if the intent is about health and safety, um, the level of acceptability is much higher. Um, this link connect a little bit on the idea of the ethical considerations and ethical concerns about the use of wearables by workers. NIOSH had published a blog in 2018, a few years ago, about ethical principles for wearable use for open safety. And honestly, the most important aspect is the objective of the use of the wearable and the data from the wearable. And Kyle already talked about that, which is true. I mean, it is very clear for the worker that the employer is going to intend to use the, the data only for health and safety. Um, the level of acceptability is much higher. That is the quite a tricky aspect because it's not the device itself that can prevent the worker to use the data for selection of workers. And, and in the case of it, it's actually quite an interesting topic because the question is to be, are we creating the super worker that can acclimatize to a certain environment or should be the responsibility of the employer to have an environment that is adapt, prepare for the worker at a certain level. And that's also, a, point of interesting aspect from a perspective of, of the use of wearables, because we are focusing so much on the worker, almost giving <clears throat> too much responsibility to them. 
But from an ethical perspective, the second aspect is the level of burden. So in all proportionality, if you will. And so basically the pushback comes when the level of ask, what we're asking the workers to do, start to be way too much compared to the benefit that you're getting out of it. And so you can imagine, I mean, Kyle was talking about other type of uh, physiological monitoring for workers. Uh, they are honestly very, they are very invasive in, in for, for the workers, so they are not acceptable. And wearables in this sense, from a perspective of burden, it's much lower. But at the same time, there needs to be an open discussion between the workers, between the employer, unions should be involved. Like, what is the framework of using these devices? What is the objective? And finally, and I'm going to stop here, the pushback comes a lot when there's not a clear understanding of what is the wearable is collecting, even from a perspective of um, not only quality of the data, but how the data is transforming into information and knowledge. Because it's very difficult for a worker to understand what does it really mean to have a core body temperature that is going you know, at different levels during a shift, how can that data set for a single shift can be used? Should I go to my doctor with that data set and say, hey, I'm not feeling well that day. What should I do with that data? So I don't think there's a solution that fit every case. And I'm sorry if I'm focusing so much on thermal stress, but it's an excellent example, to be honest. Uh, but those are the most common um, concern. And privacy, of course, who's gonna have access to the data uh, who owns the data in a way that's those are very critical and Kyle already touched base on that. Yeah, I feel like especially in a worker's uh, perspective, the the privacy uh, sector is just it's it's massive. Uh, you know, I remember putting um, you know dust collecting devices on them, and it's just you know they're bulky and they're big and they're in the way because they can't do their job. But they also have fall protection on, and they also have their hard. It's just there's so much in the way, but there's reasons why we're doing this. And I think it comes in hand in hand with training of saying, well, if you're acclimatized or just in heat in general, you know, uh, you know, this is a core body temperature. If this gets a certain, you know, past a certain degree, this is why, this is what we're measuring. Or if you're acclimatized to the work, this is why we're doing, you know, this is why we're doing these things. And it, it, I think it falls in the employer as well saying, you know, before we put this into place, making sure everyone's comfortable with this, because we are trying to collect this data. So, um, Aimed more at Dr. Cato with data. Um, are you seeing anything, you know, with data that, you know, from previous wearable technology research, are you seeing anything or are any researchers seeing any trends in, in wearable technology? Not even just is it is it working, but are they seeing any data of, you know, preventing, you know, hazards or preventing injuries, illnesses, possibly, God forbid, fatalities? Are you seeing anything? Um, I think so, even wearables. Um... There have been some example of wearables, for example, uh, you can imagine like radiation dosimeters. So by, by themselves, they're already wearables and they've been used for health and safety in occupational environments for decades. Um, but we're, if we're talking about wearables, they collect data constantly as a time series um, devices. I think it is almost too early to see and to have some data and some evidence of basically the return of investment or the, the case analysis, like are we present, preventing enough accidents or we are preventing enough injuries or illnesses without the use it. There's a little bit, there are a few studies on that. Um, it all boils down basically to three consideration, I believe. One is the idea of identification of the objective. So what is the, the wearable use it for? And I don't think, <clears throat> There is one single objective. The objective can be the identification of the hazard itself or the characterization of the hazard, all the way down to the confirmation of strategies. So at that point on the confirmation of strategies, it's much easier to, um, how to put it, to do a, a study with and without the control technology in place or the intervention and to verify those two data sets. Mm -hmm. In a sense of timely information to the worker, uh, and this goes, it's a little bit counterintuitive, but the use of wearables that can provide timely information to the workers, they go actually against the idea of assessing the benefit of the wearables. 
in a in a strictly exposure assessment perspective because people doing exposure assessment like to deal of getting a snapshot of the environment then to adopt the control technology on intervention and then to detect after but if we imagine the use of a wearable and that's why we need to be careful about talking about wearables for research or wearables for intervention but wearable for intervention by themselves they basically destroy the concept of exposure assessment, intervention, verification after, mm -hmm. which I think is good from some things because it provides timely feedback. And in the case of heat stress, I think that's very key and important to avoid dramatic effects. Um, but it's changing a little bit the it's changing a little bit the, the, the whole ideas of data analysis and understanding the performance metrics, if you will. Uh, I do believe there's going to be a lot of modeling done on data from wearables. By themselves, wearables, by definition, they collect, they might collect a lot of data or big data, which big data is not only a lot, but also diversified, very fast coming in and with different level of accuracy. Um, I'm excited about what is going to be in the future. I think there have been very limited studies at, at the moment to provide effect. There's a lot of theory and a lot of potential that can be beneficial in theory, but it's going to be exciting. It's going to be exciting in the future to see some case studies to provide. Uh, they are very limited from a risk communication perspective. Yes. From the benefit of health and safety management system. Yes from a latency perspective of minimizing or reducing the illnesses or injuries, I think that's something that's going to need to be some work to be done. Yeah, I, I, I would second that. I, I think there's a, a, a general practice in, in, in looking at tasks specifically or specific occupational exposures um, and, and what that looks like when uh, workers uh, operate within those confines and how to change those. I think that's, that's a typical way uh, to do it. So when you're introducing new technology like this, it, it's correct in what Dr. Kauda is saying it, it, that um, you actually, you take away that parameter by evaluating what that is. Um, there, there's also, uh, I make the argument quite a bit that um, it is, you know, the physiological strain or a heat strain, which is the the physiolo physiological response to heat stressors, um, that varies by individual. So even if you had the same heat stressors uh, yesterday to today, there are a lot of factors that will play into that. Uh, and so it could be um, age or biological sex or underlying disease, or, you know, it could be a, a disease an individual doesn't know about or medications are taking, how much, you know, rest that they've had, how hydrated they are. There are so many components um, that when you're really looking at what the occupational exposures are, you kind of have to look at an aggregate. Uh, and, and when you're looking at whether technology is preventing these um, incidents, you have to look at data over time or year over year and, um, and you know, tighten up some of the, the parameters there. But I, I think he's, he's absolutely correct. And when you're starting to evaluate this, you're going to ha have to look macroscopically, which means you're going to actually have to implement the technology and take that leap of faith to, to do so. Mm -hmm. Good point. Good point. Now, the second part of that question, you know, do these wearable devices, heat, exoskeletons, whatever we're, you know, there's such a broad mass uh, of, of uh, you know, uh, various tools that are out there, but do they bring any hazards into the workplace? Now, I know, you know, I know it's a, it's an open-ended question. I know some people don't want to hear what is, what is, or they're experiencing it. Um, but is there any, uh, you know, hazards that you've seen, you know, with the uptrend, it's, it's good, you know, we might have the data in a few years, like you're saying, but is there any downside to these, to these devices? Yeah, please, Kyle. I'll, if you yeah, I'll, be, first. I'll be quick about sure. it. Here. Yeah, yeah. The, the way I always uh, look at it is, yeah, you want to ensure that the technology, there's no inherent um, hazards as far as um, you know, if it affects, if it's physiological, if it's, you know, affects the skin or, or something to that effect. So it, it shouldn't encumber uh, the individual's ability to do their job, number one. But when we're talking about the the hazards and the implementation, uh, I would look to look at like the the net benefits. So um, if, if you're incorporating technology at the end of the day, um, are you benefiting uh, from it overall, or is it uh, too cumbersome or too hazardous? Are there more hazards than are benefits? Yeah, I I can spend a little bit on this. So anytime you're bringing a new technology or a new 
a, a change in the workplace in a way they want other you are disturbing a system uh, and so they i think it's it's fair and it's, it makes sense to ask uh if there's a new hazard from an health and safety perspective Perspective. I think we have evidence of a couple of ideas and a couple of things that should be touched upon. In the case of wearable technologies, they are transferring data so or electronics in general. Um, it's actually fair to say that electronic electromagnetic interferences can always be a possible concern. Um, I know that it's very rare, but I have evidence, there is evidence, for example, that in some workplace environments, real-time dust monitors that interfere with proximity detection wearable sensors. So basically proximity detection sensors allow the worker and the machine to talk to each other and to prevent the collision, right, and the injury. Well, it was found that electromagnetic fields from personal dust monitor were interfering with that. That's obviously a big concern and something that needs to be at least considered and explored, basically. The second possible hazard is honestly in the case that the wearable request, or there would be the benefit for the wearable to interact with the worker. And mm -hmm. so that goes into the idea of too much information, of overwhelming information. You mentioned the idea, Ryan, about the use of PPEs and vest, and you know, there's few few pictures that float around the, on on the internet among professionals where in the future workers are going to have like 200 wearables with 200 screens and you're going to need to you know bounce between 20 different dashboards or smart devices and 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 then at the same time you should do your work by the way because that's important too right so um that's the level of distraction and the possible need of interaction between the worker and the wearable is something that while we are discussing already now for almost um for a little bit of the possible benefit are um, quite clear, but there can be also a level of distraction. So training is critical. And even though I'm, I'm sorry to repeat myself, the identification of the objective, are we asking the workers to interact or we are using a wearable just to collect data and maybe to talk with the worker at the end of the day and say, hey, we noted that your level were a little bit high. What happened? Did you eat? Did you drink enough? Did you have the opportunity? That's actually, for especially for heat stress, there is evidence that by using wearables, and honestly, that's true for all of us sometimes, even for running or working out, we kind of know our levels. We kind of start to have, a, have an idea of our levels. So the interaction might be um, changing in time based on the use of the wearable. So I would say those are the two possible hazards. There are no measures, but it's something that should not be um, dismiss or should at least be considered from an implementation perspective and even from a design perspective as well. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, uh, you know, these are, these are concerns that I feel workers are having, you know, out in the field, because like you said, you're going to be dressing up a worker, you know, compared to 1970 to now, <laughs> I yeah. think we've come a lot of, of far, far away of, uh, you know, PPE and wearable devices and, and all that. So, Along the along the lines of workers, um, are you seeing any you know with the role of these devices providing a determine determining workers' fitness for duty? Um, it's a big term that comes into play, um, especially with medical monitoring, and you know the, you can go pretty far into the weeds of of that. But um, you know, or, or is, is there any determination that you're seeing uh, with you know putting these devices on workers that? possibly have underlying health issues or, you know, whatever the case is, do you see any kind of that direction um, at all in the field? Yeah, there's a direction. And I don't think that's only for, um, for example, associated with the idea of its stress and its strain. I will say, for example, the idea of fatigue is quite uh, as an important topic at the moment. And I would not that I need to do the 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 spill for for Kyle, but even the physiological monitoring using um, earth rate could be used for fatigue as well, not only for heat stress. So it could be a possible double use of the same measurement. But um, that's another area for um, the, where the the idea of fitness for duties comes um, quite often. Uh, drug use, obviously, opioids is a big deal at the moment. It, it's it's a um, it's a very tricky aspect to the of fitness for duty because once again, I do believe and I'm convinced that 
the role of health and safety professionals and the role of employers or industrial hygienists specifically. It is to provide an environment that is healthy and safe so that the workers can go away at the end of the day, they can go home without the risk to have an injury or health effect. At the same time, they are concept even in NIOSH of total worker health uh, or in CDC with the deal of one health that push the boundaries of the workplace into outside defense. And so in the in, in so the deal, what happened outside, it might have an effect inside in terms of the possible risk. I do believe though that it's really important that we stick with the fact that the first responsibility comes from the employer from an environment from an environment perspective which is a risk which is quite high especially from a perspective of wearables because as i said i think the idea of pushing collecting data physiological data or other type of data from the workers has a tendency of focusing on the worker and maybe even implicitly going and providing responsibility on the worker for their own data, while instead it could be the environment that is creating those data, which is a tiny difference, but it's important. So mm -hmm. I do think that is, is, if it's done in a proper health and safety management system from a workplace environment, there can be a healthy discussion in terms of if the, for duty, where basically we are trying to say, look, if based on use of wearables or other type of methodologies, it's possible to detect that the worker is not capable of performing that type of task and then can lead to a certain type of accident or elevated risk for accident or illnesses, there could be a, fair, a healthy discussion about what to do next. What could be the consequences? How we can address that as a community, as a worker, sorry, as a workplace. Um, and as I said, I don't think it's only for heat stress, but fatigue can also be one of the areas where the fit and to duty can be quite um, something that should be discussed. Yeah, it, yeah, I, I would agree with that. It, I think, especially when we're talking about a workplace, I, I think there's there are many different workplaces, and so um, there are different visions of what a fit for duty would mean. Um, so, you know, it, it could be, you know, working on a construction site, but um, you also have to think about uh, emergency response, for example. So if something happened on a work site and firefighters were called, um, it, it's important for them to be fit for duty because, uh, you know, their actions and their fit for duty uh, very much impacts uh, whether others may be safe or not. And so if, and I'm just going to throw out a, um, a theoretical, if, if you have firefighters responding to a fire at a petrochemical complex in a community, it's very important for them to be fit for duty and to be able to manage those occupational uh, hazards and stresses while they're fighting the fire to prevent something from happening to that complex, but the, co the community as a whole. So I think you do have uh, a sense of the fit for duty that's important to employers and um you know i'll also say with, with what dr kaudo was saying it's you know employers are responsible for keeping a safe workplace because they are asking the employee to work within those confines um, and that's important for an individual but it's also important for uh the other employees and so if you have an individual who is not fit for duty um and they do uh need extra help or technology to to augment them um it may be the line between um them making mistake and injuring others uh or themselves and so i you know as long as it's done with security and privacy in mind and and you know not crossing those boundaries that we've been speaking about um, I, I, it's it's not a I, I don't think it's inherently a bad thing to to want the worker to be uh, fit for duty and con consequently if they're you know continuing to do a job which puts their health at, at risk is that something they want to continue to be doing um, maybe it, it there's an opportunity for them to cross train into to something else um, where you know they can maintain a, a, a longer life and a healthier life. So it, there's different ways to look at this, certainly, but it, it's important. I think the the fit for duty. Yeah, definitely, especially in 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 Washington D.C., uh, it is a big big topic of you know what direction do we want to go, and you know are we preparing the work? Because like you said, employers are you know responsible for worker safety but you're you're being supplied with workers you're not really blaming them <laughs> for the condition they're in you're just going to protect them um the best you can so uh that's definitely a, a, a direction that we're going um 
So with new contractors that are putting in, uh, you know, wearables, say where, you know, say there, there's a new hazard, a wearable is out there that can prevent, is there any advice or any type of materials that are out there that you recommend? I know NIOSH might have some or Kenton, you might, you know, uh, I don't know if they, if they've used any, or is there any advice for new contractors that are using these? Because I'm sure, like we said, with employee pushback, it, there's going to be some um, with anything, with any wearable, because they're wearing pretty much everything else. So is there any advice or any kind, you know, any, because we talked about training as well. Is there any type of, uh, you know, pr uh, advice or materials that might put that contractor in the right direction and, and help the workers understand what's happening? Yeah, I'll say, and and, and I'll be specific to physiological monitoring and, and overheating. I, I think the vast majority of uh, the health and safety managers or leaders um, who are looking for this technology and trying to implement it are doing it for the right reasons. I, I think it, they're trying to improve the lives of their workers, improve the safety. They're, you know, if doing it with, with you know, with the right intentions, um, I, I would just, the, the word of uh, advice, I guess, is, um, you know, just be patient and and you know continue to to push on you're doing it right um there's no owner's manual on how to do it perfectly on every site um so just stick with it and i think uh, over time you'll see the benefits uh it, it's worth the the time and the effort yeah um i can spend a, a little bit i was smiling when right uh, kyle you're saying I be patient because I think that's very critical. Again, we are disturbing an, an environment and in, even more in the case of wearables, like really like asking something to the workers, uh, even more from a perspective of maybe using every day or because um, that is, would be one of the benefit. Um, from a perspective of additional advice, I think um, that's something that in IOSH, at least in the center that I'm leading for direct reading and sensor technologies, we are really trying to think about how we can help the community. And when community means uh, developers uh, and creators or curators, so people are users, so people in the field adopting and implementing. So we want to try to come up with guidelines, pipelines. Uh, nowadays, there's a lot of uh, focus on the word playbooks, like what could be the playbook for the implementation, right? Um, the main thing that we are uh, um, going to include in this type of playbook definitely is don't stick with one source of data only. Um, and don't get me wrong, I, have, I think wearables are going to have a place. Um, and again, we can stick with the focus on heat stress. I do believe wearables can have a place. And that is from a perspective, for example, of fitness uh, for purpose. What is the fit for purpose of a wearable? But they are not the only one when we talk about the heat stress monitoring. The perspective of having environmental monitoring at the same time, they can pinpoint what are the sources of heat. Um, they can be important as well. And I really don't like the idea of alternative solutions for me is more about the idea of combine solution so it's a toolbox you have multiple tools you're using for different activity different toolbox tools in your toolbox um they're all equally important and i think that helps with the implementation because instead of pushing the idea of bringing a new gadget a new device in as managers or health and safety professional we might be extremely excited about the adoption, but the workers might perceive it as, oh, okay, it's coming with a new gadget, a new toy, now we need to deal with it. Instead of getting into with an health and safety management system, okay, there's an entire plan that we wanna try to minimize the burden of each stress for the workforce. We're gonna try to use the wearable devices. We are gonna try to talk with you guys more, trying to see what controlled intervention can be helpful. Uh, we're gonna try to use environmental monitoring as well. There could be some data modeling. Uh, I don't want to make it too complicated, but it, especially because for each hazard might be different. But I truly believe that the idea of taking a little bit more holistic and comprehensive approach, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it, it can be key. And, and in that, that case, obviously, it means we need to have time to do it. It cannot be get the device in one month, everything is going to be great. And... That means also, because I understand, there's a need to identify performance metrics. Like when that program becomes effective, what are the metrics that you're using to identify that the, the, the program is effective 
within the use of the devices and technologies so that then you can go to your boss or the owner or the company and say, hey, we adopted this program, the program is effective. We have adopted technologies from sensing, monitoring for wearables or environmental um, or other type of even data information uh, transfer like dashboard and such. All these are bringing us to this point. Um, and I'm sorry if I'm making too long the, the answer, Ryan, but I think it's critical to put everything in, in a perspective that is not only the technology, while again, I'm an, an technology enthusiast, so I like it, but it needs to be all together for sure. Yeah, those are those are great points. You know, we uh, I think with, you know, implementation, making sure the workers are comfortable, you know, um, and it, and like we said before, not making hazards even worse. You know, we're trying to prevent hazards at the end of the day. Um, you know, to wrap up, I was going to ask, you know, is there any useful information that either of you had? But I think the big point is be patient. You know, I think that this is a start for a lot of wearable devices. I think that, um, you know, we are on the right track, especially with data, especially with privacy. And, you know, there's companies out there like Kenzen um, that are, you know, really the cutting edge. And then there's NIOSH behind with the research, which is great. Um, just a real quick question. It's kind of open ended. But, um, you know, is what's the what's the next step? What's next for wearables? What are your, you know, I know it's a, you know, I know we might get it a, a lot with futuristic uh, outlooks, but is there any, you know, any type of uh, insight on what's next? Uh, maybe I can start and I'll try to be brief. From our perspective, um, specific for wearables and sensors in general, we are really going to try to to talk with any operators in the sense of the users or the creators, so that there's a we have an initiative called Right Sensor User Right. We need really to be sure that there's a good identification of the right technology, the right approach, but also use it in the right way. And that means there's not a single technology that has no limitations, even from a perspective of how accurate it can be. And I'm a big proponent of even not extremely accurate technology can provide valuable information, but we need to be aware of that. And so I really... Uh, this may be a, a, a push for some NIOSH activities, but our idea of right sensor user right adopted by the entire community as a way of having an com open conversation about what we can do all together in this arena. Um, that's what I'm, uh, I would love to see in the future. Great. Oh. Yeah, I'll, uh, from a... Where we where we would like it to go, I, I think kind of sitting in a position of uh, being strong advocates for technology. Um, I, I can speak specifically to the the physiology or the human side of things. I think you know, getting the the workers even more involved and in being able to utilize the technology and translate it into their normal uh, day to day life, um, even outside of work and vice versa. Uh, so they have a better handle of um, just you know their own limits, um, but also. Uh, the best ways to stay healthy, whether they're, you know, on the work side, they're at work, uh, or they're at home with their family or outside exercising, whatever it may be. Um, I think kind of the convergence of technology that um, kind of moves harmoniously throughout their day um, would eventually be the future, we would like it to to be so. Um, but I think you're also seeing, uh, you know, especially on the medical side, uh, the ability um, for workers or, or even patients to be able to communicate more effectively with their providers and making better decisions. And it's based on data. And so I think you're seeing this even with, with Apple Health, et cetera, you can share um, readings with your doctors, they have a better understanding. And so the the better photo they have or the video that they have, um, the better decisions that can be made for you. So I, I would hope uh, in the future, the kind of technology continues to augment uh, and, and help um, humans make better decisions for their health and longevity. Great. That's, that's two great points, especially, you know, I know it's a, I know it's a tough question, but everyone always wants to know what's next. <laughs> so, you know, well, I, I, I do thank both of you for joining us, you know, Kyle and Dr. Kauda. I think this is a great discussion, um, especially with the, uh, you know, wearable technology is just one topic, like I said before, and, and throughout this, we've been hearing a lot about. And uh, I don't think it's going to go away any, anytime soon, we hope. Um, so, you know, I thank you both for joining us. And, and maybe in five to 10 years, we can look at the data and, and, and see that hopefully it's trending up. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for, for having me for sure to have this conversation. 
is part of our mission here now is trying to to have an open conversation about these technologies this advancement so thank you yeah I'll, uh, thank you very much uh, i appreciate you bringing us on and really highlighting the benefits of wearable technology um it's i, I know it's going to be many many conversations uh to, to get through to everybody but um we'll, we're patient i hope everyone's patient it, it'll be worth it hey great thank you guys thank you have a good day thank you